Hello, Vincent. Hi, hi. <laughs> uh, so everyone who's joining, uh, just so you know, it's not just us two. It's also my little cat. Uh, and because this is the internet, I'm just going to hold my mic to her face so you can all hear her purr. Oh, God. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> and, but, uh, so so internet, Vincent... internet point's done. <laughs> nice. So Vincent is a developer advocate from Raza, just like me. And uh, he has done a couple of experiments with uh, sentiment uh, models on hugging face. And he has also made a point uh it's um nlp is hard so we are going to talk about it today welcome Hi. you can introduce yourself as well if you have like anything cool you would like to share um so i mainly like i do a little bit of research at raza i do a little bit of community stuff at raza usually the, the intersection of that is something that i typically do a lot of um so that means that i do a bunch of like research tools, but I also write tools for non-English NLP for Raza, like that's stuff that I'm typically interested in professionally. Um, you might have also seen some of my talks at PyData, but that's also something I've been fairly active in. Uh, I also host this thing called Calm Code and the Algorithm Whiteboard on YouTube. Um, but it's not what we're going to talk about today. And I think what we're going to talk about today, if my cat will allow me, um, is this little uh, Today I Learned blog post thing that I wrote a while ago. Uh, as I was exploring uh, hugging face models a bit, like I've mainly used hugging face for now just because of the data sets. There's just some interesting stuff that I can play with. Uh, but this was the first time that I figured, hey, let's see if I can do something cool with models. And I just noticed that uh, there's a whole bunch of sentiment models on hugging face. Like if you go to text classification, um, I don't know about all, it's, it's not all, but like a good chunk of them are all sentiment models. Um, like I think there's a couple of like news article detection things, but like I don't know if you know the number. Maybe it's like uh... <laughs> I don't know, but probably it's probably because there is so many reviews on the internet about everything, and uh, it's easy to label as well. It, you know, compared to glue uh, ones, maybe that's why. Uh, I, so, I, that, so that's interesting because I don't know if they're easy to label. So like, like without yeah, you diving... make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so like, so I, I kind of get the idea where why sentiment might be interesting because it feels somewhat general. Uh, like if something is uh, if, if someone is being like kind of rude uh, on like Amazon.com, the same sentence would probably also be rude if it was said on Netflix. So okay, there, there, there's something general that's not necessarily super domain specific about that. So I get there's interest in sort of maybe having a general model for it. But the more you start thinking about, like, okay, what does sentiment actually mean? I mean, sarcasm is super hard to predict. But if you don't yeah, know how exactly. to predict sarcasm, then you cannot predict sentiment. So but there's lots of, like, language is, is really hard. Um, and it feels like sentiment sometimes is just overly simplified um, by just saying, oh, it's one or a zero. It's positive or it's negative. Um, so what you also see is that there's this uh, emotion detection alternatives a little bit. So we're trying to say if it's anger or if it's, uh, you know, sadness and people try to be a bit more precise. But even there, there is kinda... also something called like aspect based sentiment analysis where you go something like I have this product. I would definitely recommend it, but it's very expensive. So it has like so many different aspects mm. and most of the real life examples also have like you know, mus multiple aspects as well. So it's hard. <laughs> so it's 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 rarely that two humans talk to each other and say, product is good, go buy. Like, it's usually more elaborate than that. Uh, <laughs> um, I it, mean, it, like, it, most, of the, most of the sentences, like, when we talk, is it's it, it has multiple sentiments. It doesn't always have, like, I am very joyful or, like, I am super angry at this thing. Or, or, or you apply sarcasm. Yeah, I'm super joyful. <laughs> like the way I say it also <laughs> matters in this sense, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, oh, so okay. So, so I started thinking about it. Like, okay, sentiment is like way too hard for like a very simple machine learning algorithm to just go ahead and work. So, like, by no means or form would I consider sentiment or emotion detection like a solved problem. Um, you know, besides the whole fairness thing and when should you apply this technology, I also think it's like a, a thing that's probably not a solved problem at all. And then I came across a really cool paper. Um, so the paper is called Examining uh, Gender and uh, Bias in 200 Sentiment Analysis Systems by, I hope I pronounced it incorrectly, uh, Svetlana Kirichenko and Saif M. Mohammed. Um, I will need to touch the keyboard, uh, Noah. Thank you. Uh, but it was basically this one paper that I found, and, and they did something kind of cool. 
So they started judging all of these. Th th their goal was, can we judge all of these different sentiment analysis uh, tools? Yeah, OK, uh, sensible. But how do you do that? And then they said, well, what we're going to do is we are going to make a data set that's a bit naughty. Like it's a data set that's supposed to trigger the model to make a wrong decision. And the way that they've done it is they had like templates like this one, like person feels emotional state word, for example. And the idea was, well, we can have anger or sadness or like different emotional words in here. But the name here, we can have like names that are more obviously male or more obviously female. We can also have uh, African-American sounding names. And if sentiment models give like a different prediction, just because the name here is different, ah, okay, then we can properly say like something that's, is up. That's the model a is problem, doing something. yeah. Yes, so like if, if I have the sentence, uh, Jenny is happy and Vincent is happy, if the sentiment model says, oh, the pr probability scores for those two sentences are different, eh, we have a problem. Uh, of course, this is not a full way to judge a sentiment model, but I really did like the approach because they also shared the data set. Uh, so this is the, uh, you can also find it on Hugging Face, by the way. Uh, I saw it was hosted there as well. It's the, uh, I need to, what's the name of the cat? So just so people know, it's really hard to type when the cat is. <laughs> so please feel free, feel for me here. Um, but I have my cursor back now. Um, so, you know, if you read the paper, you find that they not totally surprisingly found that lots of these sentiment models are in fact kind of broken when it comes to this benchmark. Um, but the data set is called the Equity Evaluation Corpus uh, and has been made available publicly. So you can go ahead and download it. Uh, I just checked, I believe it's also on Hugging Face. But what I figured I would do, you know, is just have a look at the data set and kind of play with it. So um, what I'm going to do now, because this is, this is on YouTube after all, I'm just gonna show you a couple of rows of what this data set might look like. So um, I have a template. So person feels emotion word, so to say. Uh, and then the person's name is listed as well as the gender for that name, as well as a race. And in this case, Alonzo, uh, I can't know, I can't say if I judge, if I can properly judge this, uh, but supposedly this is a more African-American sounding name and then uh, a white uh, name like a, from European descent. I think Alonso is also a pretty common name in Spain. I could be mistaken, but it, it gives us a way to like group uh, together. I, I thought it was Italian. Yeah, so it's a Latin sounding name to me. Yeah. But, uh, like I, I have a cousin uh, whose name sounds very similar to this. Anyway, um, but this is a cool data set, right? Like I, I like the idea here, like make this publicly available and this way people can use this as a bet, like as a proxy to judge whether or not bias sentiment, like there it might be stuff might be wrong there. So, okay, you, you've got this ID and you've got these sentences. So, okay, what's the next thing that you could go ahead and do? Well, uh, you could go to Hugging Face and look for sentiment detection models. Um, so this is the first one that I found. Uh, this one is trained on IMDB, I think. Uh, and it's saying that, you know, it's telling me that it has like very good metrics, uh, really good F1 scores. Uh, the example that it gives you to play with is I love auto NLP, which gives me a impression how this model got trained. Um, the cat again is moving. Thank you. Um, but, you know, because it's a hugging phase, you can download and you can run it and you can uh, throw it against a, a data set that you have. So uh, in my blog post, I did this. Um, and here is the summarized result. Uh, assuming that uh, I just use this one template, so like a person feels emotion uh, or person made me feel emotion. And you just look at the emotion for sadness uh, and you look at like the different genders and you look at the different uh, sort of races that are in the name, uh, you see that there is a bit of a difference. Um, it's possible that like within a group, uh, like within a template, uh, not everything has to be negative or positive. It depends on the emotion word, right? I mean, that can help. That that can that can be. But it is kind of weird that we see a little bit of evidence here that it depends on the name. What the sentiment is actually going to be, and that's a problem, <laughs> I think. Um, and you know, there there's many different ways to like properly do this benchmark, and, and you name it. But then I thought, you know, this is interesting. But do other models also suffer from this? And then, you know, um, you do... That's a very dramatic difference, like the number of, uh, especially the joy ones. So that's the thing. It, de it depends on the emotion that's in there as well. Yeah. That's something that I found interesting too. So joy, I think, 
is indeed a relatively easy emotion to associate to a sentiment because I'm super happy. Okay, yeah, that's hard to nuance, right? But sadness, okay, that is harder, I think, because sadness doesn't necessarily mean like awful or rude or anything like that. It can be quite nuanced. But the main one thing I do care for is that the distribution shifts between the uh, gender and between the race uh, of the name in the sentence. Like that, I don't. That I'm not a big fan of. And even though you could say, well, the the differences aren't like super huge sometimes. I mean, you could say that, but I would prefer the the difference to just be zero. <laughs> like that's my um, my my sentiment uh, in this case. Um, but of course, this is just one sentiment model, uh, and this is the IMDb sentiment model. So that's positive or negative. Uh, on Hugging Face, you can also find um, the auto NLP sentiment detection from Servero. And then you can see that the numbers are different. Uh, and again, you can sort of make all sorts of comparisons. But what's also interesting is that uh, you can also go to NLP Town Bird Base Multilingual Uncased Sentiment. Uh, and this one is trained on like the star system. So it's not necessarily positive or negative, but it's one star versus five stars. Um, you kind of do see that every time that we have one of these emotions, it does feel like they come from a similar distribution. It's not like there's like huge mega, mega, mega differences or anything like that. Like two stars is definitely like the main class for anger. But that said, you do notice that, you know, white guys from Europe have a different, have like different numbers <laughs> here than yeah. uh, non-white guys from Europe. I mean, so there is something here that's also seeping in. Um, and, you know, you can go further. There's like the the, bent, uh, the Beto sentiment analysis one. Uh, you can say it's negative, it's neutral or positive. You kind of see the same effect. Uh, there's the Roberta one. You kind of see the same effect. So what I thought was interesting, just thinking about like, uh, like what can you do here, right? It is pretty hard for a BERT style kind of a model to go inside and figure out what is actually causing this behavior. So especially because of the tokenizer, if I have like my name, Vincent, um, it's like Vincent like this, depending on the tokenizer, assuming it's like the thing that people like to use in BERT, it's probably something like Vin and then Cent. Like that's, that's, that's like sub tokens that are in there. But Cent can also mean like a cent, like a penny. <laughs> yeah, that makes so much sense. So there, there's all sorts of things here that are just kind of hard and there's also all sorts of things here that are just kind of hard to tweak. So then I started wondering, well, what if I go the opposite direction? Like, you know, Bert is somewhat fancy, deep learning kind of stuff. Like, what happens if I go completely in the other direction? Like, I go for something that is, like, super duper rule-based instead. Is there a such thing? Oh, there, so that turns out there's plenty. Um, so a couple okay. of days ago, I learned about this one tool called Vader. Um, it's, like, from 2014. It's pretty old. Um, but it's a rule-based model for sentiment analysis tasks on social media. Uh, Vader stands for Valence Aware Dictionary and Sentiment Reasoner. You've got to come up with some abbreviation. Yeah, they, um, <laughs> they tried hard. They tried hard. But if you go to the source code, the way it really just works is they have they basically have strings and substrings with a score attached. So it's just like word score. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, and then on top of that, what they do is I just have a couple of heuristics. So if you go into the source code, uh, you'll notice that in the in the one file that has all the code, there is a dictionary called booster dict. And if the word absolutely appears, then there is some sort of incremental number that is also applied to the sentence. Uh, or amazingly, also has a booster increment. Or awfully, there's another booster. So they basically say there's a couple of words that indicate, or tokens, I should say, or subtokens, that indicate a sentiment going in a certain direction. And then there are different words that can say, oh, if the word really is in there, okay, then boost that direction. Um, and if uh, there's negation happening, okay, then we got to flip it to the other way around. And this is a super somewhat hacky, uh, you know, rule-based system, if you will. Yeah, but, exactly. But what they actually did is they trained it just to see what would happen. And if you read the paper, there's something kind of interesting happening here. I mean, it was 2014, so like the algorithms were a bit different. But one thing I thought was pretty cool is you basically have all of these uh, sentiment uh, tasks, like tweets, uh, the movie data set from IMDb, Amazon, the New York Times. And what you could do is you could either say, I'm going to train a scikit-learn-based model on that data set and apply it to the test set. 
or I'm just going to take this one Vader model that people made before. I'm just going to see how well they perform in accuracy. And Vader doesn't do bad. In fact, it's like pretty high on all of these. Um, like it's, it's, it's on three of the tasks, it seems to be the best performing one. And considering that Vader hasn't seen the data that it's being judged on, I would argue there's something interesting about that. It's so, it's a bit hacky in my opinion, and it totally uh, compared is. <laughs> to compared to the compared to the state of the art models, um, I would expect it to perform worse. To be honest, um, but it kind of surprised me that it performs really good. Well, so I don't know if this is like really good performance, right? So the if I uh, I'm currently comparing it to okay, what does naive Bayes do, and what do like basic scikit learn models do? I would still argue if it if it performs like on that realm, it's not necessarily bad. Um, note, by the way, this only works on English, uh, so there's definitely like a couple of caveats here. But I started wondering, well, this thing. But if we doesn't... combine the two, by the way, sorry, I interrupted um, you. Could... you. So, like, how so if... can there be a way? I mean, so you can ensemble it. So you can do stuff like uh, only make a predict, only automate the decision if both models agree. Uh, and because this model works on a very different way than the deep learning model, I would actually say, I would actually argue that ensembling here might make a lot of sense, right? Because these models are bound yeah. to disagree sometimes. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I know think... that you love uh, rule based and uh, machine learning oh. hybrid systems. <laughs> well, so... I would say, yeah, it's good, but it has so many out of vocabulary stuff. So that's why it might be good so, to actually so... go on. So here's the lexicon. So the funny thing is you can actually look at the, the, the vocabulary thing that they have. And there's a bunch. So there's a lot of emojis in here as well, <laughs> which I just thought was kind of cute. So it's like an angel kind of thing. And it's like positive <laughs> scores attached. So I thought it was just kind of cute. But OK, uh, emojis aside, there's also some subwords in here. And some of them are related to like, you know, a uh, good game and other, uh, you know, other Internet speak and slang and, and, and that sort of thing. But OK, so. So yes, there, there can be some out of vocabulary words. It's definitely true. But this lexicon isn't necessarily small. And they even have like different, uh, these are like words that are relatively common. And if you think about Zip's law, I mean, you could still cover a lot of ground. But the, the design use case here was social media. So like if you limit yourself to that, I think you can still be OK. But the main thing that I kind of like about this is uh, let's say that I have a BERT model. I call that BERT1. And I have another BERT model, BERT2. And let's say that these are pretty much the same. They're just trained on different hyperparameters. Is it going to be interesting to track when these models disagree? Or are they bound to sort of always agree and disagree? With, like the, I think models are really similar. They are bound to always agree with one another. So if I'm labeling a new data set, so to say, I think it's going to be much more interesting if I have my BERT model, let's say, and my rule-based model. Because these two systems work on a fundamentally different sort of method that if these two disagree, then there's probably a data point that's just kind of interesting to just have a look at. And it, that's the reason why I like having a rule-based system and a non-rule-based system. In this case, though, what I'm now theorizing is, what about the names? So we were talking about sentiment before and how there might be racial or uh, gendered bias, right? If the name doesn't appear here, then this plausibly is a system that shouldn't be as biased, right? Like, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, of course, you have to test this, which I did before we were doing this recording. I just, I figured, hey, I need to do my homework. I need to sort of do this. So uh, I'm, I have this notebook where I'm just installing this Vader sentiment thing. And I also have this data set that I mentioned earlier. And I kind of just figured, hey, let's just try this to see what would happen. And unfortunately, there are modest differences. But I will say, I do like the fact that this whole block is just the same, right? So there's no variation within this joy block. So that's good. And there's like not a whole lot of variation here. But for some weird reason, it's African-American female names that do seem to have different behavior in the sadness emotion, in the fear emotion, and in the anger emotion. So I started thinking, hmm, why would that be? Because that feels kind of odd, especially because it's a vocabulary-based system, right? 
But yeah. here's here's what I think is here's the coolest part about like a rule based system. You can actually try to find out. So what? Yeah, what you I went think, to the source code. <laughs> well, I I can investigate. Uh, so it's yeah, I can investigate the source code, but it's also a lexicon. I can control F and look in the file. So. What I, what I figured I'd do in this particular case, uh, let's say uh, fair, female, African-American, and is not negative. So that will be uh, this group. So there's a lot of, uh, it, it feels like there's some inconsistency here. So let's, let's, let's try to figure that out. And then, you know, upon inspection, you just look at those examples. It seems that a lot of them where suddenly there's a positive label assigned is associated to the name Tia. So it's kind of like, all right, Tia is relatively short. What happens if I Google Tia? And then I can see that, yeah, there is a token in here, Tia, that has a positive sentiment attached. This is a positive number, so it's positive sentiment. And I kind of started wondering, like, why would that be? Like, why would Tia be a, like, I don't, as a word, I don't think it has meaning. I do know it as a name. And then you look for another instance of Tia, and then it's like in influential. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and we, I think we found it. <laughs> Um, so rule-based systems are certainly not perfect. Uh, one thing we could do in this case, just remove this one line, but of course you would have to do this for every single name out there. Uh, so, you know, this Does it is... look at like subword engrams maybe? I, possibly. I, I don't know the library well enough to be able to give a proper, uh, th yeah. So you can't quote me on that because I explored the, uh, the repository, but I mean, the code is a little bit, yeah, there's doc strings. <laughs> But, but I haven't seen unit tests or anything like that. So like, it's not necessarily super easy to dive in depth exactly. Um, I do think it's really cool. You can just look into the lexicon though. Like I do think that that's quite valuable and you know, it's an interesting difference. Something this, you cannot do this with bird models. Um, but also here, I think it's nice to just observe. Uh, it does feel a lot better, which doesn't surprise me much, but even for a rule-based system like this, it persists. Right? And that's, I think, something that's really good to just keep in the back of your mind. Part of that is the data set that this thing was trained on, sure. Um, but if it, but I've tried a bunch of sentiment models at this point, and it just always appears. So it's just really safe to assume this should be a concern. Um, and if I then start thinking about like stuff we can do to fix, and I, I'd be curious to hear your opinion on this as well. Um, and this is where the live coding can end, and we can have a discussion about it. But one thing I think could be interesting is you could say, well, the name of the person shouldn't matter. So maybe before it actually goes to the model, we should yes. replace it. We should replace the name by just a person tag. Also, Gerard just said it. He said, uh, "Isn't there a way to apply part of speech tagging first and only take into account tokens that are not identified as person?" Uh, I mean, that would be an entity tag, not a part of speech. Part of speech tag will be like verb or or, or something, right? You have noun. subject subject. Like oh, subject like that. is like person. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's the same with person. Yeah, well, in, 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 yeah. So something in that realm, sure. Uh, like you can grammatically do some stuff where you can say like, "Hey, this is the subject sentence," and yeah. But but I think replacing it with a person, doing some PII stuff there could be useful. Those systems don't tend to be perfect either. Um, there's going to be a video on the algorithm whiteboard in January about that. Um, so like this is, but I do think it's it's a sensible way to sort of think about it. Another thing that I think will be interesting, and that's related to just uh, going back to my original uh, sort of little blog post here on what the experience is like. Like if I go to this uh, model right here, and, and this is like the first model I found, right? I don't want to specifically pick on whoever the person is who made this, but like this is the first model I found. Um, if I just look at this and just were to say like, let's suppose now I'm not Vincent, I'm just someone who's excited about what I might be able to do with these sentiment models. And I might be just downloading this one because it supposedly works, you know, because the recall is super high. I think here's where maybe the danger is and also where we can do something that's good. So if I look at the sort of the card here, like the model card, so to say, it tells me how I can use it. But only because the author actually has IMDB in the name can I actually gauge what data set this was trained on. So it feels like Yeah, part... exactly. So I would argue if you have a model card in here, one thing that should be in there um, is like what data set was this trained on? And then the second thing I think that's missing, and it's not necessarily a quantitative thing. Like I, I don't mind seeing these metrics, by the way. Like the fact that these metrics are around, I think that's good. But I don't want people to hyper-focus in on these. 
Because one thing that these metrics don't tell you is what's the intended use case for this model? Like, I think if every model that's uh, that's being thrown out there for other people to use, if it just kind of lists uh, like, hey, this is what our, what we think this model could be useful for, please use it for this and maybe not this other use case, that will be an unsafe use of this model. I mean, that would help a whole bunch too, um, especially for the more novices. Because I can imagine if you read like, hey, it's using BERT and it has like super high scores, then I got to use it. Um, but then you might forget about, you know, all the gender bias and stuff. Anyway, uh, end of life. Yeah, there should be something like a <laughs> disclaimer. Um, like yeah. saying, hey, there might be bias. This is the purpose of this uh, model. No, but no, not everyone, by the way, feels a model card all the time. Oh, I'm sure. Like the thing Most is, of the people do. It's uh, So I can also imagine like... I'm not the person hosting this, right? So it's kind of easy for me to say like, oh, there's something to improve. If you actually, <laughs> want, to, if you actually want to implement this, I mean, there's also some things I can imagine you'd have to concern that is kind of tricky. Uh, like if someone has a really useful model, do you want to have like a bureaucratic step in the middle? Like maybe not, uh, I get that. Um, but I mean, that also makes your model very reliable and nicely, but like, I feel like most of the people don't really care about bias. They just run some scripts and get their model and just upload and they have tons of models. And uh, yeah. So uh, you would know this better than I do. I'm not um, judging anyone, by the way. I'm for well, okay, so, attacking things. Oh, you, um, there is, there's, okay, let's, let's, there's one extra thing about this that I think might be interesting to share. So um, people that have seen my talks kind of know that I'm not the biggest fan of grid search because for similar reasons, grid search is not enough. Like it, it, it's nice to sort of compare models and it's great, but it's a rabbit hole that you can dive into and never get out of. And you might be blind for like some of these issues that are actually more important. A while ago, I, I was exploring this uh, data set called the Google Emotions data set. And it's, you know, it's a data set that Google didn't just release to the world. It's also a data set they actually took the effort of writing a paper for. And it's like another one of these sentiment data sets, right? So, uh, and what they actually do is they actually, you know, remove the name <laughs> from the sentence. They put a name tag there, you know, kind of good. Um, and what they have is then sort of a label attached for the sentence. That not, it's not a sentiment, but it's like an actual emotion that's attached. So that also means that a single sentence can have like more than just one label. So, all right. Maybe train a model on that, right? <laughs> like, that's actually yeah. that's actually nice. Yeah. So I remember first... in in Raza there is like um, multi intents ones, just like that. Uh, well, because that's most a, well... of the time you might have like multiple intents in one sentence. That's just like that, I guess. Yeah. So it's it, it is indeed similar. It's just that uh, there's a there's a couple of like differences that make it different enough because in Raza it's chatbot, so we're interested in intents. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, like it, it, there's a difference between an intent and a label, and I don't know. It's an esoteric discussion. Don't it's probably not much to get into, <laughs> but um, in but in general, like your reaction to this data set was the exact same one that I had. Like, oh, this sounds useful. Better train my model because this, this this might be fun. All right. So while I was looking at that thing, I also noticed this other website called labelerrors.com. I don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> oh, I've seen this one. That's really, that was really fun to look at. <laughs> yeah, so, but the, the point of this website is that ImageNet says that this is a bathtub and this is a red panda, even though it isn't, right? ImageNet has yeah. tons of bad labels in it and the paper attached, uh, there's also a, uh, a clean lab is a project that's attached to this. Basically, what they're claiming is, um, I think the Amazon reviews data set has like 2% label error, quick draw, like 10% label error. And you're claiming to have a state of the art model, but your labels are, labels are bad. And your state of the art model is overfitting on bad labels, perhaps. Like, and that's a serious concern. Like, we might have to redo a couple of the models. That's what this website is all about. Then I started wondering, like, okay, should I check for bad labels in this Google Emotions data set? I think I should. Like before I train a model on this, like I should check for bad labels, right? Um, so here's what I did. Uh, I basically said, let's just look for examples where my, I train a very high bias logistic regression simple model. And if on the train set, it finds examples that cannot predict correctly, okay, I should just inspect. So for every, some of these emotions, I just check, uh, you know, can I find some bad labels? And then from the top 20, I just grab a couple of examples. 
So according to the data set, these are all examples of love. These are examples of not love. <laughs> so the sentence, I love it. I would love if they make season two, I really enjoyed it. That's not about love according to the data set. And like, but there's a one for excitement where it literally says, I'm inexplicably excited the name. I get excited about how we curl, but the word, the word excited is in this sentence twice, right? <laughs> but it's still badly labeled. This is in the Google Emotions that said. And, you know, then you go to hugging face. And I think, it's, again, I, I do want to emphasize, I think it's really cool that, you know, there's a repository for all these different data sets. But if you now go to look for the Google Emotions, uh, wait, I'm looking for models. I need to have data sets. Yeah, so the emotions, uh, Google, Google emotions data set. Um, not only can you find models, so not only can you find the data set, you can also find models that are trained on this data set. And I don't know if they took the effort of removing the bad labels from it. And, the, and in this I case, the model so. cards also. And in this case, also the model cards are not filled in, right? So. Um, I don't. I don't think there's an easy solution to any of this, uh, but this is a phenomenon that I'm and I am becoming increasingly worried about because uh, it's really easy to be optimal on paper, but you can still be broken in reality. Uh, and you know, uh, that's just something to always be mindful of. Um, so yeah, when you invited me to, hey, I want to do a hugging face <laughs> talk. I think, hey, I've got material. We should talk about this. It's interesting. Uh, so yeah. They, these are all very cool findings, by the way. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of questions. Um, which text representation was used to scikit learn models in the Vader paper, a bag of words, TF, IDF, or word to vec um, This was before word to vec I think it's just bag of words. I could be wrong, but I think it's just bag of words. So people people have actually talked in the chat. Ah, oh. they <laughs> Sorry, also... we should, we should, we should have, we should have maybe like... paused. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> There's like a Sorry. conversation. So they said, Vader's a dictionary lookup type model takes representation won't matter much. But there is, I feel like from what, if your findings, there are subword engrams and stuff. And maybe they have, they might have taken um, account you know how many words are passing together, some sort of like a TFIDF or, you know, other or, things. Yeah, or like a, or a polynomial thing. Have... Yeah, so I, I haven't explored Vader in full depth. Uh, it's also like a, it's a, it's a researchy kind of a repo. So it was mainly written to like publish the paper. I, I don't have the impression it was actually maintained as much afterwards. I do know that um, NLTK actually has a, a feature built on top of Vader, which is pretty interesting. Uh, there are also other models that do similar rule-based kind of things, though. So Textacy has a rule-based system called, so that's on top of Spacey. They have a model named Depeche Mood, which I just thought was a really cool name. <laughs> um, but uh, And also, like I, I do want to benchmark this Vader model more, uh, because if it turns out that it actually kind of works, I would love for nothing more than to actually start writing a package called Spacey Vaders. I think that would be like a really cool name for a Python package. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, you love puns. First. Yeah, I, I like my puns. I do want to benchmark it first, though, because it's, it's ridiculous to write a package just because of its name. But, um, um, but there, but like I, I do think it will. I will be writing a blog post soon where I'm just going to be comparing more of these sentiment models just to see, you know, is there like a general lesson here? Uh, I do think that sentiment is a bit of a strange task. Like the more you, the more you think about it qualitatively. Uh, the more that these summary metrics just seem to... A grid search statistic really is a big dimensionality reduction if you think about it. <laughs> like that's the, the best way to describe it, I guess. We have like a couple of more questions. Uh, cool. Thoughts on extracting sentiment using STO zero-shot models. That, how does zero-shot models work once put many optional labels, say more than 100? Will it make the process much slower? I mean... I think for sure it's going to be slower than a rule-based system, just because of the way it's, you know, T, uh, T5 or something like that. You might, I don't know if the, that's a zero-shot model, but like these are typically pretty big neural networks that we're talking. So um, I also think the the tokenizer is a subword tokenizer, so that's probably going to bite you there. 
uh, the probability that it, any one of these tokens actually appears in the name and that's going to influence the output. Uh, that's just, uh, yeah, that, that's just a concern I think is also going to be in there. That said, I have to admit, I barely played around with zero shot models. I've toyed around with uh, GPD-3 uh, to do some interesting things, but uh, I don't consider myself very knowledgeable in that field in general. So I'm also not the best person to answer this question. And recently, uh, Big Science has released T0 model, which is a zero shot model that has many interesting abilities, by the way, if you haven't checked it. It, it, it has more, it is more robust against varying prompts and it has been trained on various tasks and evaluated on different tasks that it wasn't trained on. It is, by the way, uh, fine-tuned on T5 and they actually checked if that thing is, uh, if, if the pre-trained model T5 actually contains uh, those tasks as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice generalization in my opinion. Let's see, uh, Vincent is happy. What is Vincent's sentiment? Positive. Okay, so Vincent's uh, sentiment is positive. Now let's change this into Jenny. This is negative. That's weird because I'm not asking Vincent's sentiment here. <laughs> so let's change that to Jenny. The fact that negative came out is strange, right? Like that is a bit weird. Maybe that's from the pre-trained model or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, for sure. So one thing, like for sure, we could uh, benchmark the same thing on this. Like uh, that's actually kind of a nice task. Uh, I'll consider doing that for the blog post. I think that's fair. Um, I, <clears throat> I do think the bigger, the more neural the model, the more things could go wrong in theory, though. Like that, that is, I think, a general rule to be just be kind of mindful of. I'm kind of wondering what might be. Tia, we had we saw that in the previous example. Let's just try that. Tia's sentiment positive. Um, what's the name of a Marvel villain? Um, the Robo. Uh, what was the name? Of the, the villain from the Marvel movies, uh, Thanos. Thanos. Okay, let's see if I. Like theoretically, okay. It is weird that if I put Jenny in here and then ask for Vincent sentiment that it gives negative though. This is weird. Uh, not 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 necessarily super concerning. It's just weird that it doesn't say I, I don't know or something like that. Anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, there sorry. needs to be like a fallback in uh, zero shot models as well because they usually tend to answer regardless of their confidence. <laughs> but uh, I mean, overall, text contains the word happy, so it might be, it could have just said positive as well. So it's weird. I was imagining it. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, well, fair enough. Um, one thing I do want to sort of mention, it is pretty cool that you can just go online and try out a model before you download it. And that is uh, a nice feature here. Um, the, the fact that we have, I've been able to check that live <laughs> is a pretty nice one, to be honest. Um, and uh, there is another question. Uh, does contextual embedding help for bias? Um, so I've not fully, re I've done like basic word embeddings in different shapes and sizes where it's like one token, one vector eventually. Uh, and for that, I can definitely say, well, no, like debiasing doesn't work very well at all. Um, I would be surprised to learn that it does work very well for BERT kind of models. I mean, we. Uh, we could try one. Um, so <clears throat> I have no idea to judge whether or not this is the best model, but it seems to be... Oh, wait, this one is Spanish, I think. Yeah, oh, wait, this is Spanish. So I don't speak Spanish that well. So maybe we should go for a different one. NLP Town, multilingual. Okay, we'll go for that one. This is a contextualized model. Uh, so Tia is happy today. Okay, so that's five stars. Uh, Vincent is happy today. And then it will be nice if this model, if, if this number doesn't change, right? Ah, okay. So on the large scale, like the star is almost, like the probability is barely shifted. But the fact that it moved even a little bit, I mean, okay, like I, I could make a theoretical point. That's, if nothing else, it's still kind yeah. of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it, But yeah. that was cool. So, and this is a contextual model. So there you go. Um, 
So another question is, are there ways of checking data set quality afterwards by looking at the model predictions trained on them? So this is, is going to be a bit of a plug. But, I thought you uh, did, no? Well, so that's that's typically a trick I use. But uh, I also, um, after doing the uh, Google Emotions dataset example, I kind of figured I need a tool for this. Um, this is definitely version one uh, out there. So it's, it's not buggy, but like I, there's more to do here. But I wrote this tool called DotLab, uh, basically as a tool for me and also the larger community, as well as some of my colleagues at Raza, uh, to just find bad labels. The way it kind of works, like in general, the way it's designed, uh, is you're able to say, well, um, there's a couple of reasons why you might doubt a row of data. It could be that the proba values that come out of your model are just super low. Like it doesn't have any confidence in any of the classes. If that's the case, on a train, on your train set, something's up. <laughs> like, okay, check that label, please. But also if you just have the wrong prediction, if your model has the wrong prediction on your train set, also a reason to say that's weird. Now what we can do, so we can make an ensemble of all of these different reasons. And the idea would be like, uh, this is a reason object. You just give it your scikit-learn compatible model. Uh, you have a dictionary of all of these, and then I will give you the order in which you should check your uh, labels. Like I'm just going to sort the data set where if more, mo if more reasons agree on something, uh, okay, that's a bigger reason to actually go ahead and inspect. Um, there's a couple of these reasons implemented right now. So there's an outlier reason as well. If there's an outlier detected, for sure, <laughs> good to check. Um, you can also have a model that is short on confidence for the right label. So if the correct label is not getting what enough confidence. What is the difference between the two? I would think like if the model uh, raises low confidence, it might be an outlier as well. Oh, out uh, of vocabulary? So mm -hmm. an outlier, well, an outlier can, so this is also meant to be used outside of text, right? So this is all, like general X goes into model should work. Uh, but an outlier could also be it's out of vocabulary. Yeah, like that could be a reason. And typically, I mean, some of the time, the outlier reason is going to overlap with some of the reasons here. And if that's the case, that should be seen first. But if you're able, but there's also, there's actually a counter example to this. Let me just grab that. Because you can also have a very high confidence while it's an outlier. That's the one. The first blog post on grid search is not enough. Suppose you have this data set, right? With the red points, the green door, and the blue ones, right? Um, what I could do is I could say, let's remove all the areas where the proba values are low. And if we're going to do that, we're going to be removing the areas between the green and the blue. And like when two areas are close to each other, those are going to be removed. But if you then zoom out, then super high confidence will still be assigned to this region behind the red thing. I am unlocked. <laughs> Which is bad, a, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is what all mach most machine learning models do. Um, so this is happening with logistic regression, but um, I think, no, this was a K nearest neighbor. But if you do logistic regression, random forest, or like whatever neural network, this is a, this is a phenomenon that you see. So you can have a model that has a super high confidence, but it's still an outlier and therefore should still be checked. Um, even if you have pre-trained embeddings or something, like, this can happen. Yeah. Um, so that's why the outlier is in there, basically. Uh, I, I need a system that can prevent me from that one phenomenon, and I've seen it happen a bunch. Um, but anyway, there's like a couple of reasons, like two models disagree. That's also a reason. Um, you can also have like, if the top two, the suppose you have 10 classes, you have the, probe, the confidence value for your number one class and your number two one. If the margin between those classes isn't necessarily, like if that's a very small like margin ambiguity. between them. If, well, it's more like if, if label, if, suppose you have A, B, C, D, and E, and label A has like zero point, I don't know, uh, three, and the label B has like zero point two nine, and then all of these have like super yeah. small. There's a lot of confusion between two classes, <laughs> and yeah. that's also a reason to sort of assign doubt. And like all these reasons are gonna overlap a little bit, but they mm -hmm. are like like subtly different. Um, there's also like the clean lab thing where uh, they have, a, they have their own heuristic. It's from the label errors project. It's a sound heuristic. So I support it, uh, in my library. Uh, but the, the point is that I'm going to be adding more reasons to this project. Uh, I'm also going to be exploring different ways of sorting. Um, when you have your different reasons, you get a table of ones and zeros. 
I would like to sort that such that the most suspicious labels end up on top. But what I don't want is that if three reasons agree with each other all the time and one doesn't, at some point you can ignore the one reason because these three are always overlapping. I don't want that. I would also like to be a bit diverse there if possible. So like sorting algorithms is something I'm exploring. I'm interested in getting this to work for uh, Spacey as well, such that uh, you can have like entities and stuff and have some reasons for that. Um, but anyway, uh, this is my little library that I like to use for my own little personal stuff um, to find bad labels. This is what I use. So last question, I guess. So uh, does zero shot always have a defined fallback or it's just the probabilistic result? It, it gets post classification. I never thought about it. Um, I mean, the word always is in there. So it's, it's <laughs> because of that, it's going to be easy. <laughs> well, if I find one counter example where there's not a defined fallback, uh, then the answer is going to be no. Uh, but I don't know terribly much about yeah. these one shot models. Um, not too much. Me neither. I have never thought about it, but I feel like, yeah, I, I, I'm going to investigate after the talk. But I, I really, I really like the Doubt Lab, by the way. Thanks. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, so we are um, like, if you'd, if you'd like to talk about anything else, I can listen to you forever. But, uh, I, yeah, just as a disclaimer, oh, if, 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 you, if oh, you'd you. like to continue, we can continue as well, just say. Well, so, so one thing I'm kind of curious about, like... It's just I, interesting, you know, like whatever, like your findings are incredibly interesting and it blows my mind and, you know, it gives me a different perspective. Well, so one thing I'm curious about from your end, because you know, uh, I've been talking about some like some some things that I might want to change about the way Hugging Face currently kind of works right now, uh, and that has to do with the model cards. But then again, I have no idea how complex it is to force users to use these model cards. Uh, I was I'm actually quite pleased with the fact that there is even is a feature for these model cards, and that someone else can also make an edit. Uh, so like th that, those things seem kind of sensible. But like after hearing what I've said. Like, are you th are you thinking about other ways now that you might be able to use these model cards as well? Like, I'm kind of curious about that too, because you you have the hugging face perspective, right? Like, I don't, <laughs> in that sense. I mean, uh, maybe like for the post prediction, your findings are something close to your findings is that maybe people could actually. Um, leverage something like a doubt lab and uh, instead of putting those metrics like that because they usually they are usually good because it's a state of art you know birth and you know you do some uh, optimization on birth when you are training uh, we also have this tensor board uh, in the model cards we could maybe put something like that uh, the, the predictions and you know like the, the doubts the reasons uh, I feel like that would be cool uh, now that so, I think about it. But it's just uh, it's just my opinion. <laughs> one thing I guess that is good to mention because it's uh, I I I think there's also so there was a paper a couple of I saw uh, I saw a couple of days ago where they said hey there's this entity data set is quite well known has has label errors too like that's the conclusion of the data set. So what they went ahead and did is they made a corrected version of that data set. And when I was Googling it, I did find it on Hugging Face. So the, the paper, the authors of the paper, yeah, so it, identifying incorrect labels in the colonel corpus. I don't know the name of the correct data set, but I did find that the authors also added a data set on Hugging Face where they were linking to the old one and said, ours actually has like a thousand label corrections or something like that. Um, so that is something I think is pretty interesting too about Hugging Face. At some point, you could have multiple versions of the data set where uh, the community at some point just kind of goes, well, we've done our best and we are pretty sure these labels are uh, due for a fix. That is something that you could at some point maybe have on top of Hugging Face. Uh, until then, though, um, to anyone listening, uh, if you have a model um, here, um, take model card serious and consider adding what the intended use case for a model is. I would love to see more of that, if I'm honest. We also make my life at Raza easier, because uh, then I don't have to benchmark everything. That would be nice if people could actually, we have released this uh, data set measurements tool, and it also has some good, um, it's in the spaces. It's currently trending, if you'd like to take a look at it. Yes. Uh... Uh, there is a lot of nice uh, exploration uh, in there. 
Like I would love it if if people would actually use this before training a model and uh, add a couple of disclaimers based on the data set uh, on the model card that the data set was used to train uh, the model. One thing, one thing I saw this this morning, one thing that I thought was a really nice touch is the Zips Law fit. Uh, to anyone doing NLP, if you don't know what Zips Law is, just look it up. It's, it's kind of just one of these linguistic features that are just kind of nice to keep in the back of your mind because it kind of explains how language works as well. And the fact that you might have a data set that doesn't follow that, I think, is also pretty interesting. Anyway, uh, there's also some cool stuff you could do here. I, I do agree. Um. There should be a there. Someone said there should be a model card guide, but there is one, as far as I know. Oh, I I, I just have to check it. That there should be one in the documentation. I remember one for data sets. Definitely remember there should be one for one. And we have also renewed our uh, documentation. <laughs> Okay, but well, yeah. it might be around here. Uh, uh, there's also a paper a based on it by uh, by Margaret Mitchell. Uh, and, and Tim and Gerbu, if I recall correctly. Uh, no, no, it's it's not the stochastic card. It's the model card. There's a, there's a paper based on model card and its uh, benefits and everything. Um, yeah, yeah, this but, but one. Tim, but yeah. Tim and Gerber is also ah, on that. I didn't know that. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a long list of people, uh, but definitely it's a good paper. <laughs> uh, definitely a good paper. That That's definitely true. Uh, I, remember, yeah. I think I did a paper reading session with Rachel. You can find it on YouTube as well. Uh, but this was a good paper. Definitely. Anyway, thank you so much. We should do this more often, uh, like whenever you find something interesting <laughs> about writing Facebook. Maybe next time for named entity recognition biases. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, I am going to be uh, doing some stuff with bad labels in the next quarter uh, somewhere on YouTube, maybe. Uh, so when I have some cool results there, I'll definitely let you know. And uh, we, we can do this more often. It'll be fun. I agree. It's nice, nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, see ya. Ciao, ciao. Thanks for listening. <laughs>